We ready? Okay. Oh god. You ready? Crinkling. Crinkling. Are you ready? Yeah. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? Are you ready? Hello and welcome to Literary Cannibal. Literary Cannibal is a podcast for anyone who wants a fun and feisty conversation about books. I am Kirby Fenwick and I'm joined by... Neve Marnie, student by day, writer, edit by night and reader by nature. You're getting so good at that, I'm so impressed. <laughs> Very fluent. Thank you. <laughs> fluent in Neve. <laughs> um, and I'm Fee Murphy. I wear glasses and I often smudge them. <laughs> I just thought I should so, reveal some personal information about myself. See, I can't do That's the off the cuff thing. I need to like have a plan. I'm <laughs> kind of slightly fucking up because I'm in a turtle neck and I'm just, it's hot in here. Okay. Oh, yeah, turtle, turtle t shirt. Oh my god, you're the only one out. Neve. Oh, well, no, I'm, she's saying You're looking very beat necky. Like, we are, aren't we? Yeah, very cool. We're Ninja Turtles. <laughs> <laughs> okay, before we jump into book chats, a quick reminder that you that if you'd like to know a little bit more about what we're all about, we recommend you listen to our pilot episode where we delve a little deeper into all things literary cannonball. So, to our book for episode three. three. Episode three? Yes. Woo! That's exciting. Oh, wow. <laughs> Is this like out of the terrible twos into... The three, like we're calm toddlers, you know, we're bumbling around. <laughs> I feel like that's an oxymoron. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> I'll start crying. <laughs> but we have snacks and oh. I might take a nap. Yeah. <laughs> Our parents are starting to worry about which primary school to send us. Like, that's how old we are. <laughs> okay, so, so to our book for episode three. The 16 year old star Carter lives between two worlds her wealthy and very white high school in the suburbs, and the poor and mostly black city neighborhood where she was born and raised. It's a fraught situation, an often tense balancing act that is shattered when Star is the only witness to the fatal shooting of her unarmed, unarmed friend, Kaylil, by a police officer. The Hate You Give is Angie Thomas's debut novel, published early this year. After a heated auction involving 13 publishers, it has quickly garnered acclaim. Inspired in part by the shootings of Trayvon Martin and Mike Brown and the Black Lives Matter movement, many have already labelled it a classic and Thomas a star. So, what do we think? Well, backstory for this particular pick is that um, when we were having our initial discussions, um, this was, but even before I read it, I was like, oh, I want to do this one for the podcast. So this is the culmination, and I'm, I was really nervous about you guys liking it versus not liking it, because I was like, this is my baby, this is what I'm bringing. Can I just put your nerves to rest for me? <laughs> I absolutely loved this book. <sighs> I, I might just let you hang there for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks. Do you like my poker face? It's very good. That's actually. why I lose at yes, poker. Yeah. I actually don't know now. I'm nervous. No, I I was thrilled when I started reading it because I was immediately in the world. Mm. And I wanted to, even though it's quite a confronting world to be in, um, I kept wanting to get come back to the book and to see how the story um, evolved and where it went to next and what it covered. Mm. Um, I can understand why 13 publishers were vying for this book because Absolutely. it's yeah. like a seminal book. It's a book I think that um, is important for not only like to talk about genres, it's not just important for the YA genre, but it's really important in terms of the whole idea of own voices and that mm. hashtag and that movement of hashtag own voices. I think this is an excellent, excellent book. Thank there you, you. for bringing it to the table. Not so nervous anymore, Nate. Oh, That's nice. Thanks. I'm good that. Um, it is partially because it's YA, but I think there's a broader appeal as well. There absolutely is, and I have to say, I love Star Carter so much. Mm. She would have to be one of my favourite n- narrators ever. Oh, wow. Yeah. It, sh- it is such a compelling voice mm. and she's so... She's funny and she's real and honest and obviously I'm a lot older than her, <laughs> but I... Wait, you're not in high school? I'm not. <laughs> no, that may surprise some listeners. <laughs> but, yeah, I just... I felt such... Um, 
I, I cared about her so much and I yeah. cared about her family. And I know that I messaged you guys both when I was reading this. It was towards the end of the book. Mm-hmm. And I, I was scared to continue reading and I felt so invested in these characters in this situation. And I was so nervous about mm-hmm. what was going to happen. I didn't want to keep reading. I was like, yeah. I'm not sure. I, I'm too scared. What if something happens to Star or to her dad or to her brother? Yeah, her older brother. Yeah, I was just so I was so nervous, and I hadn't haven't been like that for a long time yeah. with the book. So yeah, I, I I'm just so in love with her as a character. I think mm. she's just remarkable. Her voice definitely hooks you in. Mm. I mean, from the beginning, and also I know when my first reading, because I reread it for this, I had to put it. I got to basically the part where they go over to the um, aunt's and grandmother's house. Uh, not uh, their grandmother, but Khalil's. Oh, and then yeah. I just was like, I think I need to put this down. And then that I was had heavy. To, yeah. yeah, I just had to like sit it down for a week and then come back to it. Mm-hmm. And then in, on my rereading, I almost immediately started crying because I was already so invested in the characters. I mean, yeah, so... Hot mess during this book. Something about the immediacy of how it was written um, that really struck me. I was um, trying to pinpoint exactly why I was so enamoured with the whole world and because uh, exactly how you're describing that sense of being really invested in the world, invested in the story on an emotional level and... um, just absolutely engaged in it even though it's quite difficult in terms of it's uh, not a happy story from the get-go because in terms of the plot the shooting happens within the first few Mm, pages and Mm. to actually um, engage with a character who is dead almost immediately like that's quite skilled as a writer to be able to get you to actually care about Mm -hmm. him as a person and their relationship yeah exactly because it's all coming second hand from everyone yeah and I really thought about how why do I care about this so much and I really think it's the family dynamic Mm. and I think Star is a beautiful narrator but her family are just so funny and realistic like I love her mum and dad. And if, oh, I, I love the relationship. The like relationship is, oh, God, I was listening to, like, Salt and Pepper thinking her parents would totally be getting down to Salt and Pepper. <laughs> Do you know and what? Was like, yeah. When, like, with the mum and dad, um, the, and this is maybe delving into my family stories a bit much, but um, my parents have been together for about 35 years, and they still hold hands and make each other coffees in the morning and, you know, we're quite, quite sort of, like, sickly sweet oh, and really I mean sweet. so I really identified with Star when she was like oh, you know rolling her eyes you know, about her parents you know like being quite um affectionate mm. I'm like I get you Star I get you <laughs> <laughs> and also like that flip-flop like I think what really rings false in a lot of YA is when they have when writers write a teenager to feel one way about their parents or about someone all the time. Mm. I mean, Star jokes about, like, at the end, oh, take my mother away, like, you can have her. But also then she describes her parents as, like, the OTP, the one true pairing. Yeah. Like, you know. Oh, is that... Well, there was a few things in there I was like, I'm going to have to ask Neve. I don't actually understand That's this a... teenage slang in here. Like, I knew what Tumblr was, but I thought that went away with, like, the internet no. years ago. Because I, I was on Tumblr years ago. Like, I didn't realise it was a thing that people still use. It's still a thing. It's a very, and also um, to the point, like, the point of the novel, it's a very social justice oriented um, Tumblr is, yeah. yeah. Well, the um, thing that really struck me was when she, there was one comment about, oh, the parents have taken over Facebook. Facebook? Like, <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a parent, but fuck. <laughs> Oh, it's. I mean, she's not wrong. <laughs> she's really not wrong. Yeah, I mean, my grandparents are on Facebook. Mm. Oh, they're great. Oh, <laughs> are they like active users? Not so much, but, but, but they have a, they have a Facebook presence. So yeah, they're, they're old, <laughs> they have a social presence. They do. Bless. The older generations have, have taken over. May have to become yeah. friends with them. <laughs> Add to my pool of friends. But that yeah, that back to that family dynamic you were talking about. It was. 
think that's one of the reasons why um, I felt so invested was because there was such there's such a beauty in that family. There is so much love and just so much realness about them. And, and like you were saying, it's not you know it shifts and it changes and and it ebbs and flows you know and, and they get angry and they and they get upset and as an, as a regular family does and they insult one another which yeah. is yeah. great like the whole sibling thing and oh. also with mm. because star is uh dating uh, a guy called chris mm. and he's white he's from her school and uh she's quite anxious about introducing him to the family <laughs> yeah um, uh, um, Star explains partly because it's he's white, but also it's her first serious boyfriend. Like, I'm, and that's always mm-hmm. going to be. Yeah. yeah. How hard is that? And I think the way the dad, like all the siblings, reacted to Chris is just I don't know. It was fantastic because I mean <laughs> nobody's going to give him an easy time. <laughs> no, and nor should they. Yeah. Oh my god, that scene where it's like the jeopardy, like he's black, he's black, like it was his casserole the main like a, a dish on its own. And he's like yes, and like oh no, sorry. Oh yeah, yeah, that was <laughs> when they're in the car. Yeah, they're in the yeah. car. Oh man, I loved that. And all that really in- easy interplay. Actually, part of the reason why I think this works so successfully. Um, in YA is like I don't think you could have had a novel in any other sort of category have like a scene between like the father and the daughter and basically explain structural racism as effectively as that conversation between Big Mav and mm. Star yeah and not come across maybe as preachy or like yeah too I don't, I don't think necessarily that would be a genre thing I think the way um she did it um to set up because this I felt like there are mm. several conversations which contextualize the Black Lives Matter yeah. movement and um kind of really clarify people's thinkings and belief systems throughout mm. and those conversations were um I wouldn't say easy and enjoyable reading, but it didn't feel like it stopped the narrative flow. It didn't, it didn't feel, feel like forced. it was yeah. placed, yeah, wedged in there. And I think that's what I you're saying because technique. it's a father having a conversation with his daughter. Yeah. You know, I mean, at the beginning of the book, you know, Star talks about how um, black parents have two conversations with their children mm. and yeah. one of them is how to behave around the police. Yeah. So it didn't feel um, it didn't feel forced in that manner. Those yeah. conversations that um, Big Mav was having with Star because mm. they were having them their entire yeah. lives. It felt like mm. just a it's yeah. It's, it's their reality. The world. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I also thought it was really clever how she always did it in different ways. It wasn't mm. the stock standard. Here is a scene with a parental figure and a child. We're going to explain something, but she did it in. Um, Thomas, that is, did it in different ways of bringing that information in for the reader. Yeah. Um, Such as the Hogwarts bit, I thought it was really fantastic, where um, Daddy claims the Hogwarts Hogwarts houses are really gangs and it's like this really just love that. fun yes. interesting way because they're kids who love Harry Potter they're just like and that kind of adds to Khalil and the friendship that um, she, Star and Khalil mm. have and they're just they bloody love Hogwarts they're just kids and he gets shot and it's a horrible it's horrific. tragedy that happens because of so many factors and racism that exists in the world but mm. to kind of explain like something something which is so theory, complex which is yeah, like, yeah, so layered so, but yeah. complex but also only really explained through mass media in a certain lens or often mm. explored in like mm. gangs they're violent Da, 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 da. And but using do that it with Hogwarts. Harry Potter, yeah, yeah, taking this like insanely mm. well-known and popular mm. cultural and reference white. and white, yeah. and and sort of placing it on top like that. And so then to clever. Yeah. Add the bit that they all wanted to be in the Slytherin house because Slytherins were rich. I thought, fuck, that's such class. Jesus, mm. it's so it's classy, but it's also yeah. hard. No, I mean it's comment on class. Yeah, oh, comment on class. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was yeah. just like. Oh, God, and she's a clever, clever writer. Uh, yeah, Incredible. and Thomas uses, um, like, pop culture and references so, in, like, so well and so intelligently. Mm. 
um, Harry Potter definitely is one Fresh of them. Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Yeah, and reclaiming um, all of those and recontextualizing, not so much with the two park, but that was really well done. And how, like, thematically, because um, for listeners who don't know, um, The Hate You Give, that's ref- that title is referencing um, a tattoo across um, Tupac's abdomen, which is Thug Life, and it's um, an acronym, The Hate You Give, Little Infants Fucks Everybody. Mm. Um, and how that, that how that um, tied in thematically yeah. with the novel is yeah. really, really well done. I'm Absolutely. really kind of, um, mm. I haven't seen in any interviews, I don't know if you guys have, because you, there's, uh, what's great about doing a novel that was released in 2017 is that there is so many interviews and yes. conversations, yes. like, it's like, oh. and, and we will link to a whole bunch of them in the show notes so yep. you can, um, read through them to your, uh, isn't it a joy design. to be alive in this era <laughs> <laughs> people want to talk about their writing. Mm. But when did she come up with that? Cause it's structurally, it's just fantastic. It's like, they're listening to this song in the beginning. It kind of introduces this theme really smoothly she carries it through the title of the book it just kind of brings a sense of what's things of the culture this when did she actually come Um, up with it actually i've done some reading this um book was originally a short story that she wrote in college um and then later developed into a longer piece and it was was it called the hate you give in college as well or I I'm not sure but I think I mean maybe... that two pack reference is obviously decades old so yeah so it must have been be. and also um uh, in the interview she says that she listens to two pack a lot when she writes and she I think I'm gonna paraphrase here she's like she wants to bring that feeling of like bringing like uh lyricism and also like laughing and the, the crying and like the whole um community into her writing and that's sort of that was like there was a whole lot of references there, and that's how sort of that's that's the direction. Mm, that that was her goal. I think, well, I think she has succeeded because oh, I laughed way more than I anticipated with this mm. book. Because when you read the blurb and you see the cover and you know it's about the Black Lives Matter movement. I thought, oh, this is going to be not one note, but I thought it was going to be one um, emotion uh, throughout of reading it, of it being uh, quite hard and challenging. But there's a lot of, again, back to that family dynamic, mm-hmm. there's a lot of there's a lot of humor, really there's good love, laughter in here. Yeah, it's oh, and the really love's is. really sweet. Yeah, oh. and there's and it's like it's because there's like there's so many interwoven plots as mm. well, and it's not. It's yeah, there's that. a lot happening in the book. Mm. There's so much happening. All the relationships, there's like whole lots of, like there's all of these relationships that interplay. Intersecting, yeah. Yeah. Come up within, I mean, they're, and they're like really beautiful, like small ones with um, like, for example, like Star and Kayla and that whole my brother, our brother thing. Yeah. Like, or even Mr. Lewis. Yeah. Like, the, popping up and <laughs> I, because this, they're making it into a film. Did you yes. guys hear about that? Yes. I did. And yeah. I saw on Angie Thomas's um, socials that she had to put, I am not a casting director or whatever. Yeah. I, I can imagine people are just like sending her can photos of themselves film? like, hey, <laughs> like, I'm available. I'd be interested to know what her thoughts are because it's, what's really great about um, also, it's kind of like um, how with Hung Kang, her novel that we did last month where we she had her own sort of section at the mm, the last yeah. chapter of the book was yeah. from her perspective it was mm. essentially non-fiction sort of a memoir the author's note in this it's um lengthy or well, not that lengthy it was a few beautiful pages. reading a few pages, yes, but yeah. it was more than a standard author's note yeah mm. and it really explains um the genesis of the story and the inspiration mm. and it sounds like um this is a story she's been carrying around for mm. i don't know 15 20 years i don't know however long but yeah. i don't imagine that she would just pass the film off and be like you know i think she would hold it close and just yeah well, I, I, hope I, hope, I hope so because generally when i mean i have this thing with most books that i've really loved when they turn them into a film they just destroy them and it's mm. heartbreaking so I really hope that you know there's a bit of Margaret Atwood Handmaid's Tale and there's a bit of 
you're right that she does have some sort of you control would, over the narrative. Uh, yeah, be better as not a TV to, series or a film. Oh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, not to kill you, your guys' dreams, but oh, um, <laughs> we're not we're not going to go um, away and make films. No, <laughs> no, no, I'm not that. We should make um, films. But like, as someone who's read and watched YA quite a bit, um, film adaptations can be very good or can be very bad mm. and there's not a lot of in between yeah um so who wants to be mediocre you want to be one or the other <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully oh, i really hope it's well done i really hope it has a diverse like script writer and director and all of that and not just a diverse and not just a diverse cast as well i think that will really help it sink or swim i really uh, i think you need to have mm. i think the you know the producers and the directors yeah. I think my they can't be white people. <laughs> my worry with it there. though is exactly what you brought up earlier is Star's voice. And a lot of it there is a lot of dialogue happening between mm. other people, but there are some great introspective moments and things and where it really ties it to together. A, to a mm. yeah. Especially yeah. with um uh the kind of the pressure builds up on her and she realizes the immense kind of uh, impact of being a black female in the United States at this time, mm. but also like the casual racism that mm. she's experiencing with her friends at school. Hayley. It seems like, you know, that yeah. she is um, obviously would have been conscious and, and mm. aware of that her entire life, but it seems like it kind of all blows up, doesn't it, over the course of the book yeah. that you know like her friendship with Haley just disintegrates mm. I find it really <laughs> like Rowan Haley. yeah <laughs> oh god that, that character I know that um what I found really interesting um that I read recently is Claudia Rankin's um book Citizen um and it's called Citizen an American Lyric and it's basically a long poem and how she goes into casual racism mm. is she just provides one example after the next and they're small snippets and um this is from a perspective of a older woman who's um she's african-american lived in america and she's significantly older than star but i just really wonder how because it's done so well in this book it's just fantastic like is it going to work in the film because i don't know how many people are going to read the book versus how many people would see the film yeah. and it would be a shame to kind of really not explore all those, those messages and yeah because i think a lot of what um the dad was saying um teaching his kids and things like that to have pride in themselves but to be aware that you're not safe at the moment and you're mm. not safe because other people have opinions and perspectives and they might not even be consciously aware of it until they're stressed and then you know a hairbrush could be mistaken for a gun mm. and before you know it yeah mm. something awful can happen and yeah it's complex mm. um just like a thematic sort of uh turn um how this is actually set out I thought was really well done in terms of, I mean, we were talking about trauma a lot with Han Kang mm. in that novel and I think this novel does it um, in a different way it was, and it's like a personal progression because it's so close that you've got basically the inciting incident of Khalil's death um, and then uh, it progresses and then you've got the, the segments is like however many weeks later like eight weeks later 12 yeah weeks later. the grand when she um you know she goes to um mm. be a witness to the grand jury to see whether the police yeah. officer is going to be indicted and yeah. yeah and then having natasha her pre her old friend her old friend who she witnessed being murdered in uh in a drive by yeah, yeah and that that tra her processing the trauma and how mm. that links in with her own personal growth and her code switching as well at school. Yeah. And how she, you know... Do you want to explain that a little bit more? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so code switching basically is this psychological theory where you um, act in different ways with different people. Um, for people of colour, generally that means um, having to talk and act different in different ways to be read 
as they want to be read. So you've got um, the Garden Heights star who, you know, she doesn't really have to think about how she speaks. She just, she just speaks how she speaks. Mm. And your know, family all have like a very distinct language pattern and they're all really comfortable with each other. Whereas with, um, when she's at Williams and her high school, she always has to think like, um, Angie Thomas actually has moments where she, where Star is gonna make one word choice like ill but then substitutes it for it. And those, like, really minute differences that often you don't even, like, or person doesn't even mm. have to think about, um, they have to think about. And, yeah, that... It's just another burden that she has to carry. Yeah, exactly. And then that eventual melding of self and th- thinking, you know, my whole self is enough. Mm. And how that... Actually, that... Makes... Do you feel like towards the end sh- that happens for her? Well, I think, um, yeah, in a way, because you've got, when she speaks out with the bullhorn, she's reclaiming her voice in a whole variety of ways, like, mm. because she's standing up to police who have basically, who have, like, really terrorised her inner peace and her own sense of safety. Yeah. Um, she's um, also uh, standing up for what she believes in, and also she's, like, reclaiming her voice, and she's... I think it's really important in her speech, she, in her speech when she's talking about Khalil, she's not speaking in the way that she speaks at Williamson, but she speaks in the way that she speaks at home. Mm. And that also like links with the romantic um, thread in the story as well, because I think with um, her boyfriend, Chris, they couldn't connect in that deeper level because she was holding so much of herself back because she was so afraid of being judged. She was doing that to protect herself, though, wasn't she? Yeah, exactly. That from is so from people true. like Haley. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. that's also part of the sacrifice, where it's like she's. I mean, I could, you cannot obviously you can't judge her because she was doing that for a reason. She did lose friends when she stopped quote switching as much and just. That's so true in the yeah. car ride. It's so smooth. Like mm. it's not like a. Dun, dun, like a really clunky plot line at all yeah. with her and the relationship with Chris where she just kind of um, they're traveling together at the end of the book in the car she's quite reserved and um, before that in terms of with the code switching mm. she presents herself in a certain fashion in Williamston and towards the end yeah it's just there's a sense of rhythm and pace with all the conversation and stuff and it's kind of the true version of herself but I was so wrapped up in the book I just totally missed that it was like oh wait this is a different star because it was like so realistic it was it was the text message so it was Mm. when was it a text message yeah it was a text message when Hayley sends her a text towards the end yeah and Star's just like, you know, just kind of like... Go by. Just, yeah, basically, and deletes her number. For me, that mm. was kind of like... That was kind of the moment, I guess, where it was like, that's it. She is who she is now. And yeah. if people like Haley can't come to that, then bye. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and also Haley was like... As much as I really love that character, she is a great example of microaggressions within mm-hmm. like personal relationships and yeah. how hard it is to navigate that. Oh yeah. my goodness. I that character of Haley, I was like, oh my god, I've been controlled by girls like that before. It's <laughs> so terrible. Like it's done mm. the way um, that whole high school thing was put out. I was like, jeez. Wow, like, because as we were saying before, there's so many different plot points happening here. There's different locations, and every one of them just feels like really fresh and sharp and just so on point. Mm -hmm. Um, And I find uh, what was really great was um, when she's describing Garden Heights, it's through her perspective of garden heights Mm. and i mean that's quite complex because she's between two worlds but she's she still sees it as like her home yeah yeah and you know and she talks about the neighbors you know and the nice things that they do for each other and yeah yeah yeah. that's i mean 
it's not they're not a, uh, the people that live in that in that part of the city are not a homogenous group mm. Mm. you know and there are layers and there are complexities and they're people and yeah. I really enjoyed that when the media is mentioned in this because the whole um, I suppose Black Lives Matter is the um, there's a, a line in the book that the um, the truth casts a shadow over the kitchen. People like us in situations like this become hashtags mm. and they rarely get justice. And as a white woman in Australia looking at the situation in America, it's through the lens of media and it's all um, presented in a certain way through media. And yeah. I'm not on Tumblr, so I'm not really seeing other perspectives of this Um story necessarily but it's through hashtags and you hearing get one you get one narrative yeah often. yeah but and look that happens like, in australia too i mean you look, look at the the experiences of racism that um you know also, indigenous australians deal with in this country and so often you do only get the one narrative about yeah. what that is and what it means which and is recently so as well, important events. that there are the idea of own voices because mm -hmm. It captures what a situation and a community is like, which I kind of really like that Angie Thomas kept the media at an arm's length. She didn't give the story over to the media at all. They're mentioned yeah. in passing, but yeah. it's well, that a media it was star story. Star and it's the so whole time. deeply personal, yeah. and I think that was why it, sh it shined for me. Shone? Shined? Um, uh, is it still shining? Either is that active or is it in the past? <laughs> Let's have a grammar I mean, conversation. I mean, <laughs> um, yeah, and there's so much of that. And there was like a whole lot of really great subversive um, things with language that she did. What was the officer's badge number? 119? 115? 115. 115, thank you. Um, how... So we, I think you hear, oh sorry, read one fifteen more than you read the actual. I don't even know his name. I can't even remember his once name. Or twice. Yeah, once I know or twice. One fifteen. One fifteen. Yeah. And I think that was such a great flip. Isn't that sort of from clever? What yeah, because so often it's do. the victim that is mm. reduced to this one simple story of well, their life, yes. whereas here it's the police officer that's mm. reduced to this one element. Yeah. Is that kind of what you mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And how I think that was really like smart like there's just like a whole lot of little decisions I think really made this book so strong mm. as a whole Absolutely. and the idea that um there's one line towards the end where it's like this is a worldwide story millions of people are listening to it and it's just one sentence it's kind of like FYI this is a big news story and then it goes zoom, right back into Styles' life mm. and I don't know I thought that was just She's great. Because it's not about the media and it's not about the wider world. It's about Star. Yeah, exactly. And I, and think, I think it's about Khalil. Yeah. Also. yeah. And yeah. What, what really struck me about this book was um, I'm really fascinated by the idea of stories um, building empathy. And, and I, I believe that the more you read, the more empathy you have because the books that you read help you to step into experiences and lives that are not your own. Mm. And there was there was a um, a piece that was written um, on Salon, <coughs> excuse me, and it was kind of talking about that. And and towards the end, it was saying that um, you know this book won't make the the systemic needs for Black Lives Matter disappear overnight, but it does have the potential to move the empathy dial in a th in thousands of small and personal ways. And mm. I think that's really that's really so true with this book. Yeah. Because it is Star that you are getting and it is her story and her family and her city and her experience. So it had to be told without all that outside noise. It had to be just her. I just find it really, like, as you were saying with the language, how she managed to do that because at coming from my perspective of someone who doesn't often read YA and I've only really started getting into it, mm. um, I feel like I've often had throwaway thoughts about YA of it not being necessarily challenging enough and that's mm. probably the YA that I read when I was growing up mm. was um, 
and it's it was, not deep. It's it's a it's different it's a different it's, style yeah. mm. of what is in the genre now. And if anything, um, there's probably more complex and meaningful stories in the YA genre than there might be in adult books because maybe adult books are becoming the formulaic sort of entertainment strictly yeah Yeah, whereas in why they're dealing with sexuality they're dealing with identity they're dealing with Mm. race and the audience are demanding it they're like it needs to be i know in many ways ya is is probably the most progressive Oh, probably. Mm-hmm. Because, is. and then adults, maybe, you know, when you just want to read to escape and you don't want to have to think and you don't yeah. want to have to be challenged and it's just, you know, something light and fluffy and. Mm. Well, the thing is, like, there's no narrative, there's no room for narrative fat in YA. The category doesn't really allow you. It needs to, every scene really needs to have a point and everything, it needs to be, there needs to be a progression. Mm. Um, in the forward movement as well and it, there, obviously there's reflection but also at the same time this book doesn't meander it, it keeps going and mm. also the way that trauma just you have to keep living and living yeah absolutely I think you've converted me Neve. <laughs> <laughs> like, I know it's I said like, like a couple of episodes ago <laughs> like oh, I don't really go to the YA section whatever <laughs> like now yeah. you do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, are we? How are we, are we giving this the thumbs up? Two thumbs yeah. up. Recommending. Fee. Yes, but not my copy because I want to reread it. It's very well tagged. <laughs> yeah. As we would come to expect from you. Well, I I did allude a little bit earlier before we started recording. I was like, oh my god, great Instagram social news. Something really exciting's happened on Instagram. We've got so many post-it fan pages following us now. <laughs> <laughs> and that's down to you. That's all you, Faith. That's, yeah, that's all you. That's all you. I, I didn't, hopefully they're not listening, but I didn't realize post-it fan pages existed Was it on Instagram. That's amazing. But um, we've got a, yeah. Oh, fantastic. I wouldn't say 90% of our followers are um, post-it fan pages, <laughs> but you know what? There's a good percentage. <laughs> so. And Neve, I know you're two thumbs up. Oh yeah, definitely. And also, um, coming from person as a person who reread it, um, I just get better, got better. Yeah, just got better. And there's more stuff. I mean, there is like there's stuff that I noticed second time round because I was sort of when I first read, it, I was like, oh yeah, cool. Those, those like the dad's working on roses, and now rereading, I'm like, oh my god. The dad starts working. It's like a on metaphor. The, for yeah, the dad. Yeah. yeah, this dad starts working on the roses. Then they. Make, I don't know if you saw my face just then, but it just penny dropped. I yeah, like, the conversation, oh. and then yeah. the kids working on it, and then they go into new soil, and there's this beautiful metaphor. I'm like, oh, I want to keep finding stuff in here. I feel like I feel like I will. Excellent. Oh, well, it's digging. <laughs> <Garden time>. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, a, it's, also, it's also a two thumbs up from me. And if anyone is keen to um, see Angie Thomas, she's actually coming to Melbourne at the end of August. She's going to be appearing. Fangirling. She's Woo-hoo. going to be appearing in two events at the Melbourne Writers Festival. So, And we'll link to, to both of those events in the show notes. So that would mm. be super exciting for all her fans. I'm sure she's got lots of them in Australia. Yep. Okay. that's uh, What's that? Three for three. How good is this? Not reading any books that we don't like. Oh, so yeah. much fun. I was about to say something negative, but that yeah, that's really positive. It's much more fun. <laughs> it's much more fun to read books we like. Yeah, yeah, that is so true. And also, we've set, we've found things to talk about even without the controversy, which is nice. The controversy of like um, of disagreeing majorly on like oh I hated this book no I loved it like oh, I too much not, drama. I think it's nice that we can sit here and just just have a love in about a book yeah i think it's great <laughs> i've just got a couple of books that i've read recently that i think are just awful are you i kind of want to one yeah no i'm not going to suggest <laughs> any of i'm not going to suggest them but there's been a few maybe books you can where... have anti-recommendations oh my goodness mm. there's been a few Avoid. and i i just I like i've that vented to several people about a few books that I've read recently and I must have really gone overboard because a couple of people were like I'm so sorry you had to do you had to go through that and I'm like okay maybe I should dial this back like Okay, so yeah. speaking of recommendations, let's um, let's jump into our recommendations for this month. 
Neve, do you want to go first? Okay, sure. Let's let's do this. Okay, so I have four items on my list. Let's jump into them. Um, so my first item, I think, will go for there are more beautiful things than Beyonce. Is are there though? <laughs> I've made that joke too before. I yes. Oh, well, yeah, Beyonce I say rip off as well. <laughs> I was thinking her twins, her little bubbers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's such an amazing photo. There are. Um, oh, man. Such a beautiful collection of poetry uh, by Morgan Parker. Um, I. I'm tempted. Actually, you know what? I might just do a little reading. Oh, please do. Yeah, okay, let's. <laughs> All right, okay. I'm, I'm scooching forward. Um, which one should I do? Oh, this is this is big. This which is one? spontaneous. I love yeah, it. Yeah, this is spontaneous. I am flicking through right now, like, trying to find one. Neve's got a great um, poetry <laughs> reading voice. Because She's so dumb. This is, <laughs> I don't you. know if the listeners know how we match <laughs> the, the three of us. Oh, this one, yeah. In poetry class? Yeah. We're, yeah. we're a bunch of poetry <laughs> nerds. We really are. Okay, um, I will... Yeah, this one is called White Beyonce. Sneezed on the beat and blessed herself. Her love goes viral, her love of teeth and starch collar. Her husband is a baseball cap. She shakes his hand goodnight. She tips a bowing manicurist who thinks she's president. Her daughter is at the academy wrongly pronouncing Spanish. She watches Turner classic movies and sees herself there. Up in the country club, she dines with her friends. The conversation is breezy. Doesn't look the waiter in the eyes or ordering vegan chicken salad with amenities. She sees into her past. The conversation is breezy. She's been in the dictionary since she was born words Victorian highways she's unrevolutionarily flawless feminist approved she vacations daily she woke up like a million bucks slipped into lazy panties it's always sunny her husband is upstanding of course the tabs call him mister she performs and the coverage is breezy what rosy cheeks what milky vacancy her daughter learns about beauty discovers nothing surprising Mm. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh man, and and more yeah. in this beautiful collection of poetry. I cannot recommend it more. And it does like, have a great cover, which yeah. I know is a super superficial thing, thing for me to say, oh, but definitely. it really does have a fantastic cover. Whoever just iridescent it, letters and yeah, mm, brilliant. Yeah, whoever decided just to have because there are two covers. And oh, okay. Both are like both are really good, but I think this cover with just the text was a good call in terms of like this really draws the eye mm, mm, um, yeah, the other cover um, which I, I'll put up on the Insta thing on mm. our Instagram account the other cover is really eye catching as well because yeah. I, when I was in America at the mm. start of the year and I just kept seeing it everywhere and I was like it's, I'm glad that it's as good as its cover is. Yes. <laughs> the cover promises something better. and the poetry delivers. Oh, nice. Mm. Um, okay, next poetry collection. Um, Vivek Schreier. Uh, even this page is white. Uh, this is... Oh, man. This goes... Delves really... As um, there are more beautiful things than Beyonce. Really delves into sort of racism and... Um, but more specifically for the, even this page is white, really delves into ugh, the ideas of like allyship mm. and what that means and this whole idea of like trying to navigate identity. Oh man, like you go into this maybe thinking, oh yeah, I'm an ally and then you, th- you read it and you're like, oh fuck, I'm racist in so many ways. Like, yeah, wow. oh man, it's really... Like, the, all the poetry is just... Oh, I'm trying to think of how to describe it. Um, it's laid out on the page and makes yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. There's How it's laid out is really interesting. I'm just trying to... I think the poetry kind of speaks for itself in a lot of ways. And now I'm, like, flicking through, like, ooh, which one should I do? Um, Two poetry readings in one night. We are Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, just... Oh, the imagery is so beautiful, like, so beautiful and so, like, really just grabs at you. Um, 
Sorry. <laughs> You'll have to get some tabs off Faye. I know. I'm just... <laughs> We're uh, sponsored well, by a post-it note <laughs> magazine, so that's fine. Tab away. <laughs> Tab away. Well, the thing is, I'm the one who edits, so I don't feel too bad. Um, <laughs> you can just cut this out. Is that what I you're saying? I love the power's gone to your head. <laughs> You're just all like, hey, ladies, you know who's in charge. <laughs> well, I'll be the one like thinking, oh god, my voice. Oh god, this awkward silence. Can you um, put some beats behind me and stuff like that whenever I'm talking? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> I can try. It sounds kind of circusy. <laughs> it's a little bit circusy. <laughs> yeah, some new songs. Nice. That's accurate for me. <laughs> my life is a circus. Okay, um, this one is hashtag not all white people I don't know your story this is true you're a good person sterling intentions golden heart extra mile your parents labored you grew up poor picked on and kicked out haunted by loss many truths can be true at once you can be all of the above and you can be racist Mm. Mm. wow that's so tight yeah yeah, like, there's so much. I can understand what you mean by the imagery, but there's a sense of brevity that there's like oh, yeah, space definitely. so that every image is stark and just. Ooh. Mm. Mm. How, it's almost got that kind of not cliffhanger feeling, but you kind of just dropped at the end there. Oh That's yeah, great. definitely. There's no like you don't. This isn't a comfortable read. Like every single poem, really like. How hits you in the guts? Yeah, there's there's no barokeness here. It's very stark. Mm. Um, it almost sounded declarative. Is it mm. quite? Is she, in terms of with the collection of poems, there's that theme linking it all, but it sounds like there's very strong messaging. Is that quite clear with every poem? Um, yeah, there are some that are a little bit more cerebral, a bit more um, uh, not as grounded. Mm. Um, but then there are also poems like, for example, there's like there are quite a few found poems in this collection. Um, this one is uh, fi- uh, sorry, 54,216 signed petition to ban Kanye West from playing the Pan Am Games closing ceremony. And the entire po- poem um, is just two pages of comments um, accompanying the petition. Oh my god. Yeah. And that one is than Ebola and Hitler. Jeez. Yeah. And that one, forcing yourself to read every single comment is kind of like I think what would it feel what it would feel like to have to deal with every sing, single ignorant comment all the time, just over and over. Mm. And how it just really wears away at you. Um, so yeah, also highly recommend this yeah. poetry wow. collection. It's Fantastic. really, really powerful. Um, and then uh, another an article by Ejima Olu O. Mm-hmm. The article is called "White People Always Let You Down," and thematically, it's kind of what we've been discussing. Uh, basically, the article is about how navigating being a woman of color and trying to navigate uh, personal, intimate relationships with white people and having to feel like you have to look after them look after their feelings yeah and that emotional labor and the toll it takes on you and how in every like the sense of disappointment where you you think that someone is like a real like a real ally or Mm. whatever that really means um and then being disappointed yet again and again and having to try and like i think um the end of the article is hopeful but also it's really um, how she uh, describes that and how she has to navigate that. She describes it really in depth and really well. So mm. I thought that was um, a good read. And then finally, in a somewhat um, drastic tone shift. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. Just a little. In honour of the fact that quite recently... Um, Jane Austen, there was her 200th death anniversary. I was about to like yeah. cheer that, but then you put dead in there, and I was like, no, oh, yeah, okay, I, I went 200 cheer. years it's since kind she's of, died. Yeah. It's 200 kind of, years since she absolutely smashed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so that uh, anniversary is quite morbid, and so is this film. <laughs> 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 Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. 
A film? Amazing. I didn't... <laughs> they made that a film? Yeah. Oh, it cool. keeps popping up on my Netflix Ca- I can came recommend out, it, like, but I haven't watched it yet. Oh. Yeah, it came out a few years ago. A film I did not expect to like, but did. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you would sit down. Why would you commit to watching it if you're like, I'm not going to like this. I was with a friend. Oh, okay. <laughs> so they wanted to watch it and you were dragged along. Yeah, very much. And then pleasantly surprised. Yeah. I was re- it's really quite feminist and also... A- Apart from the fact there are zombies and they're fighting zombies, it's actually quite close to the canon. Yeah. Um, in a lot of ways, like That's a lot amazing. Of, yeah, a lot of the interactions are like directly lifted, and also it works because like you know during that era, the Regency era, there was a war, but it was obviously they've just sort of the author has just transplanted a completely different type of war, so it makes mm. sense. We yeah, know. right. <laughs> um, so there Who are... knew Austin was leaving space for zombies <laughs> in well, Pride and Prejudice? Her punctuation is pretty her fast t- and loose. Before loose. her time, yes. really. Before uh, her time. Yeah, if you need to be convinced, go on to YouTube and um, the, uh, Darcy's first proposal scene, oh, I suppose it's the only proposal scene in this version of the film, um, is interesting because it is basically almost to a T the exact same dialogue but it's a fight scene what did they do with oh my god yeah wow okay we're gonna we're definitely gonna link to that youtube video in the show notes what do they do for the wet t-shirt scene oh that's like my concern is that still in the film they do they they reference it i don't know if there's do they reference it or reenact it they like, like he, am I he committing dives? to this? <laughs> yeah. If I remember close, if I remember, he dives in. I can't remember if he like a wet t-shirt walks out though. In my, Ugh, you're gonna have time. to watch it. <laughs> you're gonna have to watch it. I, I know what I might be watching, and it might be a Colin Firth something. <laughs> <laughs> also, the Bingley in the Prime Bridge is a zombie in this version. The Bingley is really hot, and it's like re- it really threw me. <laughs> That is such a great character in the book. I was surprised in the um, BBC version because um, I was like, oh, it's better in my head. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of your head. Yeah. Your re- what are your recommendations? Oh, I thought, okay, all right. I will open up about my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't often do that, but sure, record this. Um, I've, uh, I've uh, tried to trim this down. I did mention earlier I read some meh, things that weren't so great. But, hey, I did mention um, to you guys a little bit a while ago that I'm going to start a tiny letter. Yeah, yes. super excited because it's something I want to do. And that's all the justification I'm going to end just, um, Because I find it like talking to you guys about stuff I've read recently, God, it's so great. So I may as well just do that and mm. I might slag some books off in the process. But hey, um, <laughs> it's, it's all like, about recommendations. In the, in the, yeah. Yeah. Recommendations here, recommendations and anti-recommendations in the tiny letter. Well, yeah, and it's hopefully not going to all be naggy because, like, like you said, it's great to read a great little, book. A little controversy, mm. though. Yeah, there's a like, few things I want you to read because I think we need to discuss. I just have <laughs> you have You have so many rants. I can see them oh, behind your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're ready to emerge. Uh, through the smudged lenses of my glasses, <laughs> you can see those rants. Oh. Fantastic. Um, so let's go to the nice, Fiona. Um, these are... I've read some really great books this month as well. So it's been a roller coaster. Like, Rodan Keating was right. Like, life is a roller coaster. <laughs> <laughs> great song. Um, El Defo is a YA graphic novel by C.C. Bell, and it was released uh, a couple of years ago. I should really write these dates down. But um, I love this graphic novel so much that I had my electric blanket on it was tucked up in bed, it was probably 8pm but it was I just had so many feelings reading this because um, kind of comes back to the own voices movement to read something with someone who has deafness was just magical and heartbreaking and familiar and oh, really sad now oh, babe. Oh. But I'm yeah, so was, glad that that it was so special yeah. I highly recommend anyone to read it because it's I don't know it was 
beautiful, absolutely beautiful. I'm really sad. And then I read probably one of the funniest books I've read in so long. Oh, God. And <laughs> welcome to my head. <laughs> um, basically, um, this book is sexy and funny and it's not YA because it's no. pretty fucking out there and it's great. <laughs> Have you read, sorry, t- say what the book is first. Uh, Nell Zink, Miss Laid. Have you read any of her work? No, this, this was the first time. This was my introduction and I was like, who is this woman? <laughs> she is just like, basically I've never read, um, it's, it's a satire set in the 1960s and it goes into so much where within the first like 30 pages it just does this massive switch and I was like wait what (laughs) the fuck just happened and I like texted a few people going I'm reading this book and I don't even know and it was a roller coaster ride of um talking about race but it's through the it's so hard not to plot spoil this book but basically there's sex there's drugs there's racism then there's all kinds of funny moments but it's so sharp that some punchlines some jokes are set up right at the beginning and the payoff and the punchline is on like the last few pages but then there's within scene jokes as well so there is bits where i'm like am i allowed to be reading this like, just, oh wow you should, you should read the wall creeper i've read the wall creeper which is by nails Inc. as well and it is just like it's absolutely mad but it's just such a great story i think i must have read it in like a day or like over a oh, weekend wow. it was just like i i'm just like oh. racing through this book it's just so mad but she's incredible i was carrying this book with me everywhere i mislaid and then like people at work because i'd be reading it and i'm i'm a loud reader because usually i'm like <gasps> <laughs> and i'm flicking pages not ripping pages usually but um like and then people at work would be like oh what's that about because it's quite a evocative cover yeah mm. and um then i'll be like oh psh- like so many things have happened within the last 10 pages I can't actually summarize what the book's about even though I'm halfway through and then the next day they'll be like how's it going and I'm like oh my god things have changed and it's, it's just it's, the wall creepers very much yeah. like that as well dynamic yeah like ooh, oh man ooh, you ooh. have completely sold me on this book no worries <laughs> <laughs> are you kind of half sold me on the pride and prejudice zombie thing that you left the wet t-shirt thing I'm, I'm sold confused. on the pride and prejudice <laughs> <laughs> thank you what out to <laughs> I'll see I'll see if it's a good Mr. Darcy and then I might continue <laughs> Um, and then I also read In Other Words by Jean-Pa Lahari. Have you guys heard of this book? I have, and it's on my list. Like, uh, you guys know my list is ridiculous. Oh, yeah. But, yes, I'm it's really keen to read this. List it's a pretty list. Yes. <laughs> it's a hefty list. It's a hefty is a good word. <laughs> um, read this. It will take you, like, a day because it's gorgeous. Yeah, it no. is just – and also oh, – so keen. Beautiful typesetting. It's basically a series of essays with one short story and they're more kind of thought piece reflective sort of things so they're not very long each of them and it's basically her um, kind of exploring the Italian language so she's Bengali American um, grew up there but is always um, kind of had a yearning to learn Italian Mm. and she kind of started doing it in sort of a not a half-assed way but in a half-hearted doing little bits and pieces little bit of classes here and there and then she um kind of makes the decision where she can't live her life without learning Italian and committing to the language so she moves herself and her family over to Rome wow that's a big call and Mm. she starts learning the language and she's won a lot of awards for her work so she's written about four novels and she's won like the Pulitzer and she's like fucking incredible yeah, well, writer yeah. <laughs> but then she's like quite early on in the piece she makes the decision she's like I can only write in Italian now I love this language so much and I want to commit to the language of it 
Italian. And if I'm writing in English, I'm cheating on Italian and I can't... Hang on. Was this written in Italian and translated to English? Uh-huh. So no. she, oh. she doesn't even did do the translation. Do she no. doesn't. The woman who did My Brilliant Friend, um, Goldsmith, Rosemary Goldsmith, I'm going to get the name wrong, but whoever did um, Frante's books... Um, those translations she did this translation that's incredible oh. the, and the language it's beautiful but the essays difficult would it have I mean if you're because if she's a natural like English speaker like if English is her first language to write in another oh, language that would have been and she did it in a achingly wow. short period of time as well like so she started kind of dabbling in it 20 years ago and doing mm. bits and pieces but only really committed to the language over a two-year period. That's amazing. Produces a book in it. And the metaphors are so layered. Like, it isn't, like, simple writing. It is stunning poetic That's writing. That's why I would think, mm. you know, if you were writing in a second language like that that you were only just new in, mm. it would be surely yeah. it would have a... What, yeah. a, what an incredible it's, woman. It's That's so, amazing. so incredible. I'm like, what... A, gift because also with the the actual book itself it is stunning like the yeah. end pages are just gorgeous and like tr- 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 and the paper is so thick and beautiful like it's oh. very it's a textual experience yeah. <laughs> oh I love when it does that like you can uh, yeah the ends, ends are rough or no it's just a nice thick page it's mm-hmm. not like this wasn't cheaply done <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination because on the left hand side of each page is the Italian on the right hand side is the English <gasps> So it also gives you a thrill that you're getting through a thick book rather when quickly. You're really. when, when you're not really. You're, reading you're only it. reading half the pages. Yeah. <laughs> That's so when I say you get through it in a day, it's like you dash through it. But then I would make myself stop occasionally and be like, oh, there is the Italian. Like, it's great. And then like, oh, it is. Actually, and it's not in a smug way at all. It's not like, here is the evidence that I wrote in Italian. It's just a really beautifully... Mm. laid out book yeah that's really that's what really a style amazing. Yeah, I actually so... studied Italian in high school for very briefly so I want to get that book and see how many words I know in the <laughs> Italian oh, yeah. probably like five but anyway that's, that's better than me <laughs> so interesting also in the language and how you how you approach the le- language when you learn it yeah. later in life is so different and how that impact the right that'd be so interesting oh, oh, fascinating awesome. and I actually um, so this isn't just a fee recommendation I recommended it to a friend who's been learning Italian in kind of a on and off way for the last 20 years she read it and she thought oh my god this book is good and her Mm. daughter-in-law and her son live in Italy and she's sent a copy of the book over to them because she thinks it's going to help them with the language and that kind of connectivity of Mm. like it's something so challenging to learn another language but to live in another language that isn't your own. It's really the best way to learn it's like mm. just immersing yourself in the culture and yeah, definitely. but also to can you ever truly be fluent fluent in a different language is a theme that they kind yeah. of explore because she's a writer as well, um, mm. Lahari, um, Lahiri, and um, yeah, it's just to to hear how a really talented writer and someone who's a wordsmith approaches words in a different language and it's. Amazing. <laughs> okay, well, that's going to the top of the hefty list. And this one is a little bit lighter, a little bit like it's winter in Melbourne. Fiona Murphy has been staying home quite a bit because her electric blanket is wonderful, <laughs> as is her kettle. <laughs> and I've been listening to um, Sanfa, who is from the UK, and his album dropped in February. So, okay, I've been spending time at home before winter here I just like, I just like <laughs> lounge around the house but his album is called Process uh, it's his first full length album and it is so great it is really really good the lyrics are amazing uh, the sounds um, it's kind of in part lo-fi sort of bedroom sort of he did a lot of kind of mixing himself before he did his first studio album and it is Sampa all over and it's just oh I just you know when you are in bed it's you have to get up really early and it's dark this has been the reason why I've been getting out of bed really like not wow. sleeping in because I'm like fuck it I'm just gonna 
dance a little bit before I go to work because this album is great. Like, mm. but it's such a fantastic way to start the day with a bit of dancing. Yeah, I'm gonna do that tomorrow. Wait, you guys don't always do that? No, no but I will now. <laughs> Okay, I've revealed so much about myself. But, um, we'll put his um, thing in the show notes because his name is spelled S A M P H A. Yeah, right. Which I sometimes say to people, it's Fiona with a P H, and they're like, what? I'm like, no. That's, that's a lame joke, sorry. <laughs> okay, so to me. Yes. So um, I have a really interesting one, a uh, couple this this month, but something that caught my eye on Netflix actually just last week, and I've binge watched the entire first season and gone and watched the documentary, is um, Glow. Oh, wow. The gorgeous ladies Good of effort. wrestling. Um, so so I watched the I watched the documentary first, yeah. and then I jumped straight into the TV series. So. Um, yeah, Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling is set in like the '80s, and it's about this um, the development of this um, this TV program, Glow, Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling, with women wrestlers, which was kind of unheard of. Um, just fantastic. I just, I mean, the documentary was amazing. To actually, you know, they went back and, and spoke to all these women who were mm-hmm. the original wrestlers, oh, that's and fabulous. Uh, it was just remarkable. It was it was so great hearing their stories, you know, and seeing like the archival footage, which looks, I mean, of course, it looks. You mean the it's, outfits and the hair and? I mean, mm. in, in the documentary, you know, the footage from the original, the original wrestling was, um, yeah, just incredible. And then the TV series is so great. And I mean, I'm a big fan of '80s fashion, so not really to wear myself, just to look at and appreciate. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of that going on, and um, yeah, it's just, it's just really wonderful and. I mean, I'm not a massive fan of wrestling or really a fan at all. I, I mean, I used to watch it when I was younger because my brothers would control the TV and put on, you know, WWE with The Rock. So, I mean, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily a big, a big fan of wrestling. But what I love about this series is the physicality of the women and the way they use their bodies in these really sort of unexpected ways, you know, which is one of the reasons why I fell in love with the AFL Women's League early this year and with women's football in general. It's that kind of... We're, we're not conditioned to see women use their bodies in that way, mm. you know, and then you see them up in this wrestling ring and they're throwing each other around and jumping off the rings and doing these, like, remarkable stunts. And obviously it's all... You know, I mean, it's not legit. Yeah, they're the sort of wrestling, time, but it's, they it's that. just beautiful. I heard an interview with Kate Nash on BBC Women's she's Hour. In, and she's, she's in, in it. Yeah. And I'm such a huge fan of her music. I still listen her to British her. British accent sounds fake, but oh, I know really? it's not. Like, oh. she's really British, isn't she? But her accent sounds fake. Which is, maybe when which is mum. remarkable. All the other accents. Yeah, but she was she's describing the, the physical stuff of it being like really having to intense, do the training, yeah. But then having to perform in the 80s outfits. And she's like, do you know what? Fabrics have improved. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, the ventilation, it just yeah, all that you know, polyester. What? <laughs> yeah, it's nice. difficult to keep the lady guard and healthy. Even, you know, I mean, uh, there's all these women together, and you know, they talk about periods and sex, and you know, I know. I, I nearly got through an episode without talking about periods, but you knew it wasn't going to happen. But it's just, yeah, I just really loved it. And like I said, I just binge watched it over a couple of days. I just wanted to get to the end and. Mm. Um, there's just some really beautiful stuff in there and yeah, I highly recommend going and watch the documentary first. Give you a bit of a ground um, in the story. Do yeah, the definitely. First. That's right. what I did. Watch the doco first and I sort of was coming at it with a little bit of knowledge then, the TV series, and then jump into the TV series and and just fall in love with the whole thing, which is, yeah, what I did. Um, and my other recommendation for the month um, was an essay that... Um, uh, was retweeted into my feed um, by Rebecca Solnit who um, is an American writer and I'm a big fan of hers um, so it's uh, in praise of libraries and the forests that surround them it's on Literary Hub 
Um, wonderful essay. I, I mean, I love libraries. That's pretty clear from anyone that speaks to me or follows me on any kind of social media. You should see Kirby's wallet. It's basically driver's license, library card, library card, library card, library card. That's yeah. actually scarily accurate. Um, yeah, so that's a, it's a lovely piece. Um, Rebecca Sonnet just has this wonderful sort of meandering style of essay writing. You just feel like you're going on an adventure with her and mm. you never know where you're going to end up and, you know, just talking about... Um, libraries is a place of wandering which is mm. which is kind of beautiful mm. you've got to think about it like that so yeah how gorgeous yeah it's a nice way to yeah. <laughs> finish up the recommendations isn't it libraries yeah. is a place of wandering mm. it's just a really lovely kind of visual I think yeah mm. okay there's something that I wanted to tell you guys a funny little story that happened this week and Neve you were there yes um so friend of the podcast Kayleen mm. um she was telling us a little story about her son um she was listening to the podcast and um he jumped into the car and he said to her are you listening to the laughing ladies again <laughs> <laughs> So that is our new like <laughs> subtitle, I think. The, the laughing, laughing ladies. ladies. It's very, very cute. I thought. I that love was the really alliteration cute. as well. Like, it's good, isn't on it? On point. Very <laughs> clever. So that's kind of like our first, like, sort of review from that we a bit of feedback that we got from um, from Kayleen and her son, sort of in, in person. As opposed to my siblings who have given me so much feedback. They're like, Fee, calm down with those weird noises that I you have, make. I've like, had some lovely emails from a friend of mine, Daniel, who was mm. um, been listening to uh, listening to our podcast and had some lovely emails from him as well. Oh, also People keep asking me about your voice and where you're from. Yeah, you're very think that you your have accent, an accent. Yeah, your accent is very ambiguous. Oh, ambiguous. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in the Christmas episode when I do my sister act singing, because we are having a choir, right? Yeah, no, I thought we were. Yeah, yeah, totally. yeah okay, cool. Okay, cool. So the reason I'm telling you that is that um, if you enjoy what we what we're doing here at the Literary Carnival, aka Laughing Ladies, um, we'd love if you could leave us a rating or even a review on iTunes. That would be really sweet, and we would we would really love you. And feel yeah. free to do poetry and alliteration in the reviews. Like we will read them out. Yeah, be creative. Sure. We will definitely yeah. we will definitely read our not and not well, and we're not like yeah, highbrow poetry we're talking people talking ourselves up a bit. We'll read our reviews out. <laughs> yeah, it's just I think a solid acrostic poem could be really great. <laughs> well, that's a challenge. That's a challenge to us. Well, like yeah, if it'd be like, <laughs> like literary cannibal is quite a, like a long title. Yeah. Maybe just Love, go for literary. Interesting, timely. You can just, you know, just <laughs> rip them. Well, you've already, you're halfway there. Lit. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm just like, back, 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 back. <laughs> We're so interesting and timely. <laughs> Why not? Okay, so I think that's all we've got time for this month. <laughs> yep. Thanks for listening to episode three of Literary Cannibal. We hope you'll tune in again next month when we'll be talking about Blue Skies by Helen Hodgman, a 1976 Australian classic from an author not especially well known in Australia. Mm. So I'm really looking forward to that one. In the meantime, if you want to continue the conversation or you just want to be digital friends, you can follow us on Twitter at Lit Cannibal, on Instagram at Literary Cannibal, or find us on Facebook at Literary Cannibal. And make sure to check out our website, literarycannibal.com, where you'll find a full wrap of the show notes and a full list of and links to our recommendations. Definitely check that out. It's literarycannibal.com. And if you have something to tell us that's a little more than 140 characters, send us an email at literarycannibal at gmail.com. Dot com. Righto then. Woo! Okay. Episode three. Have a cup of tea. <laughs> Time for a cup of tea. <laughs> oh yes. Yeah, sorry. This, down for some tea. This needs a nap. <laughs> okay, that okay. sounds over and out. Okay. Bye. Bye. Is City Library going to be in your recommendations this week? It's in my life. It's not just <laughs> a one-off recommendation.